for you to stop listening. Red Lava is a professional speaker, leadership trainer, author, presentation coach, and the owner of your next speaker, LLC. Red's presented keynotes and seminars for over 20 years in 48 states, including Canada and the Bahamas, to over 1 million audience members. Red loves his wife, his three daughters, and he loves helping people develop strong leadership and presentation skills. I need you right now to give you the biggest Colorado welcome to your speaker, Red Lava. Thank you very much. Hey, since we're in the mood, let's go ahead for Jay and for Kayla and for Haley. Let's give them a big round of applause for all the time that they spent today. They're awesome. Hey, thank you all for coming. You know what? Turn to the two people beside you. Give them one final high five. Say, great job today. You guys knocked it out of the park. Now, I didn't get to see the pink room. Pink room, did you guys, uh, round of applause, you guys have a good time in the art gallery? Round of applause, pink room. You guys make it happen? Yes? There's three people clapping on behalf of the pink room. You guys, uh, Haley, Haley spent a lot of time with you, covered a lot of stuff, but uh, I'm sure that room was great. The yellow room, the green room, the blue room, you guys knocked it out of the park. I hope you guys thought that today was very valuable. Um, I've got you for just a few minutes left. And uh, let's begin by, let me ask you this question. How many people in here have a younger brother or sister? Raise your hand. How many people, your younger brother and sister, has ever tried to injure you or set you on fire? Or they're just mean to you on purpose? Raise your hand. Give me an uh-huh. Of course. And why do they do that? They do that because that's what they're supposed to do. It's in the contract, right? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I, ha I live with four women, and, and I'd like to... I'd like to begin our final leadership lesson of the, of, of the morning and get ready to be the afternoon by telling you exactly what I mean by I'm going broke and a little more insane every day because of my four women. So, so, so there's my wife, of course. Her name is Ashley. Everyone say, hi, Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Yes, Ashley is 5'11", and uh, she is the boss, and I'm okay with that. Right? Uh, and then we have three offspring. Um, these, these three offspring live, live at our house, because that, 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 that's where we keep them. And they are all females. They've been females their entire life. Um, that joke means different things now than it used to. Um, so we have a, uh, we have a 10 year old, her name is Vivian. Everyone say hi, Vivian. Hi, Vivian. Vivian, let me tell you about Vivian. Vivian is a, is a people pleaser. She's always nice. She either likes you or she fakes it until she does, right? How many people in here, you, you have at least one friend that's always nice, always friendly, always kind. Raise your hand if you have at least one person like that. Come on. First of all, seven million people on the planet. Some of you do not have your hand up. You don't know at least one person that's always nice. You need to go buy some new friends, right? You've got to find at least one person. That's my Vivian. My Vivian is always nice. So whenever I was leaving, for my week-long trip, I was also on a trip last week in Oregon, so I've been missing my ladies for a number of days here, and all of them gave me a car, right? And the car that Vivian gave me was, a, was, was actually a journal, but she wrote in the first page, and then I'm supposed to fill out all the rest, right? So that she will know what I've been doing. And in the introduction of it, she said, um, Vivian, uh, basically it says, my daddy is going to go on a trip for two weeks to go work so that we don't have to live like hobos on the street. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's the 10-year-old human mind at work there, right? So that's my Vivian. I'll skip over my 8-year-old for a second. Let's go right to the 4-year-old. Her name is Emerlin. Everyone say hi, Emerlin. Emerlyn is, uh, well, there's something special about Emerlyn. Um, let, me just say, let me just say it this way. Uh, I, I've been teaching her new words, of course, because she's four. She doesn't know the complete human language, right? So I, so, so I taught her all the G words, right? and the really good ones. Guacamole, Guadalajara, Guadalupe, my favorite, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, right? Hey, you haven't lived until you've heard a four-year-old human female say Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. It is phenomenal, right? So we got to the G words, and I thought, you know what, I'll teach her a different language. So, so I'm going to teach her Sicilian, right? I teach her Sicilian because I am a godfather, right? That's two Bs, godfather. One of my best friends in the world is named Bill Cordes. He has three sons. I'm the godfather of his youngest son. His youngest son is my godson because that's how the relationship works. Godson, godfather, you're with me. Let's move on. So in the movie, the godfather, they speak Sicilian. So I taught my four-year-old the word capiche, all right? Capiche. 
Now, a toddler word competes for two reasons. First of all, it's phenomenal to say. It's an awesome word to say. Matter of fact, everybody, on the count of three, say it with me. Ready? One, two, three. Go, baby. Right? Great word. If I were in charge of naming our children, their names would be Kapish, Kapish, and Kapish. Kapish. The other reason why I love to teach the word Kapish is because what it means. If you, if you don't speak this in, you know what Kapish means. Kapish basically means, do you understand what I'm saying? Am I going to have to Uncle Luigi break your kneecaps? All right? That's what Kapish means. So I teach you the word, and she actually knows how to use it, right? So she knows how to use it. So we were watching movies in our house a couple of months ago because that's where we watch movies is on the couch. And, uh, and we watched the movie and it was over, just Emmy and I. And she said, Dad, put on another movie. So I got up, I took two steps to the left and she looks at me and she says, Gopish. And I'm like, you're gonna own a small country one day. This is <laughs> Like, I love you a little more now. And I gave her $5, right? It's awesome. So that's my four-year-old. Then we have an eight-year-old. Her name is Addison. Everyone say, hi, Addison. Hi. Addison's on the career path for two things. She's either going to be a lawyer or a criminal when she grows up. These are the two careers that she's shooting for. Now, now you, that, that may sound mean to you, but you don't know my Addison. So uh, I have 72 stories about why that is true. In the interest of time, I'll only share three. So Addison had just learned how to not be herself, okay? <laughs> Make all that body training where you're from. But uh, she just learned how to not be herself. And uh, it was early in the morning. Actually, and I were in bed. And we were awoken to a small, half-clothed human being. Luckily, it was our child. Uh, it was the last. And at that point, I don't remember the timeline when they learned not to pee themselves. I'm sure she was like, I don't know, seven. No, she was, I'm sure she was like three, right? So she's fully clothed from the waist up. From the waist down, nothing. Nothing. It's wearing skin. That's good. So Ashley looks over at me. She's like, you're taking this one. And I was like, yes, ma'am. So I get up, and I go, Abs, come on. We keep the children upstairs, right? So we walk upstairs to her bedroom. We get up to her bedroom. This is what we find. Okay? Here's her bed. Seven steps, toilet. In the middle, underwear, pajamas, soaked in urine. What Addison had decided to do was to wake up that morning, really need to go pee, Take two steps, decide she can't make it, drop trowel right there, and urinate over the whole deal. Right? Just now I'm sure she was like, oh no, oh no. I'm sure she was like, yeah! Woo! Right? We can have some fun with this one, right? So I look at her. I mean, part of me is like, <laughs> this is awesome. This is amazing. But part of me was like, what was going through your brain, right? So I look at her and I say, Addison, why did you do this? And she looks up right at me and she says, Daddy, I just wanted to mix it up a little bit. <laughs> like that's, that's the mind of a three-year-old human, right? I just want to mix it up a little bit. I'm like, all right, that's fine. Let's go pee on something else. I'm at the door. You want to go market territory over there? No, that's my room, right? Like, what are you doing? And she has no answer for it. So the other story about Addison is all, all, all the ladies, okay, I got three stories. The second one, all the ladies in our family were at the Nutcracker play, the theater, okay? It's a holiday favorite. In Tulsa, at the Performing Arts Center, all the ladies, and all the guys, we talked our way out, and we were watching football. All the ladies were at the Nutcracker play. And this is whenever Addison was four. And uh, you don't go to the theater with my mother-in-law and not sit on the front row. You just don't do it, you wait till the next night. So all the ladies in my family are on the front row, right? An intermission happened. Now if you're not familiar with the theater language, that's halftime, all right? So halftime happened, and at halftime of the play, there's two things that happened. All the guys stand up and stretch out all the anxiety and stress that happened to be at the Nutcracker play. And all the ladies go to the bathroom in groups. They all go together in groups, right? You never see one. If you see one lady going to the bathroom by herself, she just can't find another lady, right? That's still. So here's what happened. Now, I wasn't there, okay? I've never been a female. I've been a guy my entire life, right? So I wasn't there, but my wife told me this story, and my wife is the most honest person I know, okay? Like one time, my wife got too much change at Walmart. They gave her 25 cents too much. She took it back into Walmart. I would not have done that. I would have been like, Walmart owns China, all right? We're going to keep the quarter. Not my wife. She took it back in. She's a fine lady. So this is how it went down. Okay? Intermission. Everyone's standing up, milling around. Lady 
at the end of the row, okay? That's, that, that's going to be you. Yes, raise your hand, my dear, if you think I'm yes. And tell me your name. Uh, Debbie. Debbie? Okay, Debbie is playing the lady down the end of the row that's not with our family. Debbie's now playing a 65-year-old black woman, all right? It's not. It's good. It's, good. it's, good. it's a good part. It's a very important part in the theater, okay? Uh, Debbie has got to go pee. She stands up. She makes her way. <laughs> nice. She makes her way between the front of the stage and the front row where my little four-year-old is sitting, right? And as Debbie's making her way between the two, Addison stands up, reaches back, and spanks this woman right on the tube. Yep, spanks her. And Addison said it wasn't just like a little bit like, ooh, don't sit here. It was like, yeah! Right? Like, she reached back and got some, right? And Addison said, this lady turned around like, I'm going to kill somebody. Saw that it was this cute little four-year-old human terrorist. I right, just started laughing. Because when a four-year-old does something wrong, short of you know shooting someone, it's hilarious. It's like funny. Ashley apologized immensely. The lady was fine. She went on her way. As soon as the lady went on her way, Ashley grabbed Addison by the shirt, pulled her right up into her business, and said, Addison, why did you hit that woman? And the first thought on Addison's mind was, Mom, she just looked like she needed a spanking. <laughs> Right, that was the deal. That's all she needed, right? Now, if I would have been there, I'd been like, let's go. This is awesome. Let's go spank somebody else. This guy, he needs to spank it. Come on, let's go, right? I mean, that's just crazy. Now, the worst part about the story is two weeks later, the same thing happened at Walmart, but it was only Addison and I. Oh. Here's Retro. Smallest child. Lady we don't know. That would be that. Yeah. I think I stole some milk that day from Walmart, right? My wife takes quarters back, I still dare. That's our relationship with Walmart as an establishment. And so, it's, you know, you're really like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I mean, they're just children, right? I mean, yeah, what are you going to do? And so, I don't want you to think that literally Addison is eight and she has a parole officer, okay? She, she is a great kid. So let me just share one final story. Addison comes home, first day of first grade. Okay? She's in third grade, it's two years ago. First day of first grade, she comes home. Which, she came home every day after first grade, but the first day is when this story happens. She goes right upstairs to her bedroom, gets her American Girl doll. Okay? Now, if you're not familiar, particularly gentlemen in the room, you need to know what the American Girl Corporation is. It's a company designed to take every dollar from every spot in America and the globe, all right? So the American Girl Store, it's in Dallas, Texas, closest one to our house. We get in a train, there's a train that goes from Oklahoma City to Fort Worth. It's pretty cool, right? We took a train, three hours to Fort Worth. We got in a rental car. We drove to the American Girl Store with our children and spent three hours buying dolls, one doll a piece for each child. They, the dolls got their hair done. They got their nails done. These dolls left with college certificates. What is wrong with America, right? I was in the corner banging my head against the wall 82 times. But guys, you know, what we do for our ladies, for right? we gotta take care of them, no matter how insane it is. So, first grade, into first day, Addison's goes upstairs. She gets this married girl doll screen sound. This is her prized possession. This is her fave. Right? And we're like, Addison, what are you doing? What's going on? She said, Well, I made a new friend today. Her name is Tori. And Tori told me she doesn't have very much money. And Tori told me that she didn't have very many dogs. So I want to give her some. I want to give her one of mine. And we were like, we love you. <laughs> you are so our child. You may be a criminal, but you'll be a very friendly criminal. <laughs> you'll be very nice. Right? I mean, we were like, that is so awesome. But what did she say? I mean, she said, I want to give something, one of mine, to Tori. But what was the one that she picked, right? It was her favorite prized possession. It was her number one thing. Now, maybe that doesn't mean much to a room full of high school students, right? It, 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 it doesn't mean as much even to, to you know, parents as it does to a, right, a six-year-old. She made a big commitment to say, this is what I want to give to Tori. And you know what, my Addison and my Emerald and my Vivian, I mean, the reason why I tell you these stories is because, yeah, Ashley and I are parents of children, but, you know, we're parents of, of, of leaders, you know? And that's what every parent is. 
Your parents, your guardians, whoever's in charge of you, they have been helping you decide how to use your leadership. Right? It's not a decision of whether I'm going to be a leader or not. It's a decision of how am I going to use it. Vivian uses her leadership in kindness. She is, she is nice to people, and that works. In Emerlin, we don't know what she's going to be yet, right? But we're doing our best with her. We're even teaching her other languages, just in case. Right? And, and Addison, when Addison spanked that stranger, right, she was being a leader. Now, it, what I mean by that is she had a thought, she wanted to make a decision, and she went and did it. Now, hopefully she will make better decisions as she ages, right? But she was, being, she was being a leader when she decided to give that doll to that new friend that she had for one day, right? Because, guys, leadership is service. Right? Leadership is service. Leadership is being there for others, right? And I'm proud that my girls are like that. They're not like that naturally. They're like that on purpose. They're like that because we've influenced them to be that way. Now, here's my question for you. How about you? How about you? How have you come to be up to this point in your life? When people think of you, what do they think of? Hey, guys, we have wasted our time this morning. We have absolutely wasted our time. If you don't care about the stuff that we've been teaching, if you don't care about improving your body language, if you don't care about how you give presentations, if you don't care about networking, if you don't care about college, if you don't care about using your technology to be a better officer and leader, then we wasted our time this morning. You see what I'm saying? It could be the best material in the world, but if you don't have an interest in doing something with it, we should have stayed at home. I literally should have woke up this morning and just went right back to bed. I'll tell you a story about my Addison because my Addison, she's got initiative. She's going to make happen what she wants to make happen. And that's called being a leader. What are you going to do with what we gave you this morning? What are we going to do? What are you going to do? It's 12-12 on this afternoon. What type of decision are you going to make regarding the experience we've had here this morning? And here's what I know for a fact. This is not an opinion. The students in this room that are going to decide to go take at least one or two of the aha moments or the tips that we gave you this morning, just one or two, if you go and put those into action, your life is going to be better because of it. Grand Junction, Colorado, two days ago, finished my networking session. Talked about going and meeting decision makers, right? Talked about making connections. We were on break midway through the morning. I saw one of the FBLA students in the uh, facilities management office. It was right next door of the room we were in on, on uh, CMU, right? And I said, hey, Jack, what are you doing? Or no, 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 I said, Jack, you need anything? He said, no, I'm good. I said, okay. I got, he wouldn't. I, Shouldn't have been in there, right? Somewhere a student shouldn't have been. I was like, fine, I want to see what was happening. So I walked out, and then I went back in there about five minutes later, and I asked Amara, Tell, and DJ, the people that I had met, right? meet your decision makers. These people at facilities management impacted the quality of our, our event that morning. And I asked Amara, I said, what was Jack doing in here? And you know what Jack was doing? Jack was asking for an application to work in that office because he wanted to go to CMU and he was taking action on the networking lessons that we just talked about. Jack was being a leader. He was the only one in there. I'm not saying that anyone else that was you know, at the program that morning that didn't walk in there and ask an application weren't being leaders, but Jack wanted to go to CMU and wanted to work there, so he went and made it happen. What are you gonna do with today, my friends? What are you gonna do with today? Are you going to use it for good? Now, guys, I'll be honest with you. The reason why I'm here today has nothing to do with networking. The reason why I'm here today has nothing to do with FBLA. The reason why I'm here today is because of this. This is why I'm here today. And many of you have been looking at this and seen that I've been carrying this and walking around with it. And probably wondering why. Well, this is the reason why I'm here today. And what I mean by that is, when I say, are you making the most, and are you going to make the most of this morning, it's not just a cheesy Hallmark greeting card, cotton commercial question that I'm paid to, to, you know, to ask you. I mean it. Let me tell you why. August of last year, I was playing golf with some of my buddies in Edmond, Oklahoma. We were playing at Kicking Bird Golf. 
Why were we playing there? Because it's the cheapest golf in town. Did I mention we have children? Right? We were playing golf in the August last year, 2014. And that particular morning, I could tell that something wasn't right with my eyesight. Now, I've been wearing glasses or contacts since I was your age, in fact, since eighth grade. And so I thought maybe I just needed an updated prescription. It was time to get, you know, a little thing. Because studies show I'm getting older every day. So I called my eye doctor, her name is Dr. Julie Moore, and we scheduled an appointment for the next Tuesday morning, the last Tuesday of August of last year. When I went in there, if anyone has had an eye exam, know one of the first things that they do is take pictures of your eyes, check the health of your retinas and your optic nerves. And Dr. Julie came right back in, put up the picture and said, Rhett, there's something wrong. I've scheduled you a CAT scan at Mercy Hospital, which was 10 minutes from her practice. You need to call Ashley. You need to go down there. There's hemorrhaging in your optic nerves. I don't know why, but you need to go find out. So I call Ashley. She meets me down there. And an hour later, what the CAT scan revealed is that I had a tennis ball-sized brain tumor sitting right here, sitting right behind my left eye. And it had grown so large that it was pushing everything out of the way. That's why there was hemorrhaging in my optic nerves. It didn't have space to be able to flow normally. Now, when you get that type of news, you know, what do you do? And Ashley and I are people of faith, so we pray very specifically. And then you start asking questions. Right? One of the first questions, obviously, is, is it cancerous? And you don't know that for certain until they take it out and they do a biopsy on it. But you have a pretty good idea along the way. And what I learned that, that afternoon was that there's two different types of brain tumors. One type is like spider webs in your brain tissue. And those are very difficult to remove. And many times those are malignant, those are cancers. And then the other type is actually the type that I have, which I call my, my tumor Wilson, by the way. That's his, that's his name. What we found out was that Wilson was the different type, which is separate from the brain. It's just up there in the same apartment, but it, there's, there's not an interaction tissue-wise between the two, okay? And those are easier to take out. And my particular type of tumor, it's called a meningenoma, 95% of the time, meningenomas are benign. It means no cancer. So we started getting news that was better pretty quickly. And by the way, if we are talking about networking, the gentleman who was giving us all the news that day, those first three days at Mercy Hospital, I've known since we were five years old. We went to school together. I graduated 36 people from Laverne High School in Oklahoma. So did Dr. Jess Arnold. He's an oncologist at Mercy Hospital. An oncologist is a cancer expert. What's the chances? What's the chances that the one time that I would be most in need in my life Someone who we've known since we were five would be there. So guys, when I told you earlier that your college network is for ever and is for the rest of your life, well, so are some of your other networks. And Jess told Ashley everything that she needed to hear right whenever he knew it. And he said, we don't, we don't know. Day one, they thought it was going to be advanced brain cancer. Day two, could be benign. So we went on a month-long journey to figure out where we could find a team of neurosurgeons to take Wilson out and then to get on the road to recovery. And we found a team in Dallas, Texas. At the end of September, three days after I turned 41, September 24th, 2014, they took seven hours to take my, my Wilson out. And when I woke up from the surgery, I knew that the beautiful woman staring at me was my wife. I knew that her name was Ashley, and I knew that my name was George Strait. So that went back, right? <laughs> Two out of three. Uh, it was a tough, it was a tough road. You know, I was not making any sense. Some of you probably think I don't make any sense anyway, but I was not making any sense. Like I was calling my left arm my nine. I was, I was asking nurses to fluff my medicine. I meant my pillows. Like, woohoo! 
remember, you, you know, I just had brain surgery, but Ashley looked at the ICU nurse and was like, is this normal? Is this supposed to happen? And she looked at her and said, we don't know yet. <laughs> so Ashley slapped her and found someone else, right? I mean, but I mean, it was, it was, it was a big deal, literally. And what I mean by that is not only, right, did I have brain surgery, but I was off work for 80 days. And I am our business. And Ashley and I didn't have disability insurance. I couldn't drive for 15 weeks because of damage to my eyesight, which I still have today. You know why I asked you to move so close to me in the workshops? It's because I can't see very well. I weighed about 300 pounds because I was on steroids for three months, which made me want to eat everything. So I did. Oh, and by the way, I had brain surgery. I couldn't even lift a gallon of milk. Someone else had to steal it for me at Walmart. <laughs> so it was tough. But I'll tell you today, at 1221 on this day, my life is better because I had brain surgery. Now, how is that so? Well, that's so because of what's written on the other side of Wilson. What's written on the other side of Wilson is live to serve. And there's two reasons why I'm sharing this story with you students. And one is live to serve. So Ashley and I didn't have disability insurance. I was off work for 80 days. That first night at Mercy Hospital when they discovered that I had a tumor, three of my friends took my phone and went all the way through the rest of August, all of September, all of October, all of November, and took all the engagements, all the speaking events that I had booked on my calendar, figured out when they could take them, and told Ashley, we're gonna go do all these, you guys just pay us the expenses, and we'll send you guys all the income. That was a $45,000 gift made like that. We had thousands of people praying for us. We had people that gave to us in ways that I didn't even know you could give to somebody. Our lives were saved because of the people that lived to serve us. So what does this mean to you? Well, it means a couple of things. Guys, when people think of you, I don't know what they think of, but your life is gonna be better if when people think of you, they think of someone who serves others. When people associate the word service and help and giving to your name, your life is better. Because you're spending your time helping make other lives better. And this is not an adult conversation. My 10-year-old knows how to serve people. Because it's the reason why she exists. I don't know if you read the fine print or not, or if you've been told this, but the reason why you are on this planet is the same reason why every other human is on this planet. It is to serve. That's the purpose. That's why we are here. That is why you exist. You exist to serve. Why do we teach you body language? Because you need to know how your body speaks to people and so that you can serve them better. Why do we teach you presentation skills? So that you will know how to serve people better. Why do we teach you how to use your technology and why do we teach you networking skills so that you will know how to serve them? That's the, that's, the, that's the end game. That's the reason. That's the why are we here. Anyone in this room that has complete joy and happiness in your life doesn't happen because you have a lot of money. Doesn't happen because you have the right friends. Doesn't happen because you wear the right clothes. You have complete joy and happiness in your life because you serve other people and you're focused on making other people feel good. And lift other people up. These people over here against this wall, they live to serve. That's why they do what they do. That's why they put up with you every day. It's because they live to serve. And they absolutely love it. And they're leaning against the wall because they're a little tired. It's because you are a handful. Right? The other thing about this is that there's some of you in this room that you're going through this story. You've got someone in your life who is facing some type of challenge, either medical or otherwise. And your heart's a little heavy this morning, this afternoon. And here's what I say to you. Your job is to serve those people. Your job is to take care of those people. Your job is to be there for those people. My tumor was benign. 
I have no cancer. I have no tumor. I weigh 215 pounds because I will work out. And I eat better. And my tumor changed my mind about how I was treating my body. And I'm healthier today than I was before. Because I want to be there when my children are 42 years old. Your people in your life, no matter what they're struggling with, they need you to serve them. Start there. The other message, the reason why I'm here this afternoon is because of what's written on the other side of this. Because of Wilson. Everybody in this room has got Wilson. Everyone in this room has Wilson. I'm not saying you need to go get checked for a CAT scan. Okay? What I'm saying is a tumor exists to kill cells and to grow. But we all have tumors in our lives. We all have something that sole purpose is to kill the good that's in our life and to grow. I don't know what yours is. I have four or five, and I'm working on them every day. You've got a Wilson. You've got something that's holding you back from giving your best. I don't know what it is, a relationship problem, something about your attitude, something, a decision that you made, stuff that you're putting into your body that you shouldn't, a way that you think about yourself. Hey, guys, everybody in here has a Wilson. Here's what you need to do. You need to go to work on it. You need to go to work on it today. Don't blame other people for it. Don't say it doesn't matter. Don't think that you can be the best of you, even with it. You need to go to work on it. And you need to go to work on it today. Because if this is why we're here, we only serve others by being able to give them our best. And we can't give our best if Wilson's blocking it. And my friends, trust me. I know. You can do it. Took a tumor for me to get rid of the biggest Wilsons in my life. And for me to go to work on the biggest Wilsons in my life. And it made all the difference in the world. You can absolutely do it. Jay, Kayla, Haley and I, we love you, we don't even know you. And that's not weird at all. We hope that our presence here today has blessed your life in some way. I hope that me getting the brain tumor <laughs> has blessed your life in some way. And I'm so glad that you were here. I hope that you absolutely are glad that you were here today. And I hope that you had a good time. And uh, you don't have to go home, but you don't, you can't stay here because this conference is now over. Thanks for coming. God bless. You. See you guys. Be safe.